I am not an expert in history. I'm just going to preface that right now. I have kind of an odd background. I was a classroom teacher for 18 years, grades 1, 3, 5, 8, and uh, I was a principal and a vice principal. I was a sales trainer for Macy's East Coast, and I've uh, done a little of this and a little of that. So why in the world would a museum hire me? Well, the director of a museum is largely in charge of the operations of the museum and not necessarily the historian. We have people who volunteer to do archival work for us, and so I basically make sure that all the operations of the museum are in order and functioning. So I will tell you what I have learned about the Folsom prison, um, but I am not the expert on it. 20 years after the state legislature of California appropriated $250,000 toward construction of a new state prison, the actual construction of the prison began. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. It takes a long time between the release of monies and the actual building. The state was wrestling with the issue of prison overcrowding in San Quentin. Again, we have the same issues today. San Quentin was the state prison at the time, and so it was overcrowded, and um, they needed to deal with those issues. <clears throat> Prior to that, the real prison was a ship that was off the coast near Vallejo uh, and towed prisoners toward uh, Point San Quentin. And so it was named the Spanish Block. Uh, San Quentin was because of that. Then in 1859, the state was wrestling with what do they do with the overcrowded prisons, and it was determined that they needed to build a new maximum security prison to house what they called habitual crime offenders and the incorrigible. Uh, doubtful that our prisoners today would be considered to be incorrigible. The first time offenders would remain at San Quentin, but repeat offenders would be sent to another facility. Well, by 1869, Folsom was selected and named for the maximum security prison site because it was considered to be a wilderness. Folsom was, at that time, just a little village, a gold mining village, with a few little markets and such, but by and large, it was a wilderness. And so, uh, it they needed an isolated area. The American River formed a natural boundary on one side, and so they believed that they could build walls out of granite on the other side to uh, make it a maximum security location for a prison. So on October 17, 1879, which is item number 10 on your quiz, under gray clouds and some rain, the first shovels of earth were turned by then Governor George Perkins and it was said that even the heavens cried that day. So why did it take 20 years to build this prison? Well, there were no environmental impact studies in those days, so they still had bureaucracy, so they had a lot of red tape with labor and land issues. So drawings were made, they were discarded, and so the governor decided enough time had passed, they needed a place to house the prisoners, and so uh, construction began. So huddled under umbrellas in a little semicircle on the edge of a bluff with rainy skies, Governor Perkins turned that first shovel with what would become one of the nation's first maximum security prisons. Do you know if it is still considered maximum security today? It's a medium level. San Quentin is maximum, but we are now medium. Plans called for 328 cells with heavy iron doors. Now, Barbara was kind enough to rope out uh, the size of an actual cell for those 328 prisoners on the floor, which was eight by four. There were no windows. There was only a heavy iron door at the front, which had a three inch by 10 inch slot, which was the only ventilation for those cells. There was no plumbing. There was no electricity. The prison cells were to contain two prisoners. Now you can imagine that in that little cell block having two prisoners. They were uh, housed with two wooden bunks, straw mattresses, straw pillows, two blankets, and two buckets. One that was for your drinking water, the other was your toilet. The natural occurring gray granite was used for building the gothic style cell walls and the tower. Mortar was placed between the layers of granite. And then the only foreign object that was used was sheet metal that was layered 
to the granite after those cells became too high and cumbersome. I have some core samples of the granite that occurs naturally in the area. And by the way, who knows what the village of Folsom was called before it was named after Captain Folsom? We have this in our permanent exhibit at the museum. Granite City. Mm. And it's because of all the outcroppings of the granite that are throughout the whole American River area. <clears throat> so Grant Bay thinks they have the hold on the name, but no, we were <laughs> Granite City first. So all of the walls were to be built two feet thick by six, six excuse me, two feet long by six inches thick. Block was first completed with 162 cells, and that was cell block A. And then uh, cell block B, 166 cells. Roof was then added, and by July of 1880, the prison was officially opened. After the cells were made, work began on the administration building and the guard tower, and these two cell blocks remain open even to this day. They are used. Yes, they have been modified because of current regulations with the prisons, but those original cells were so well made that they remain to this day and are used. However, single inmates, not double inmates, are in them. In the administrative building, um, they had wood burning stoves, which at that time was needed for heating and cooking. And the granite tower that was built in front of the administrative building served as the armory for many years. And by the way, I want to pass around two handouts as you are, are listening to me because I have pictures of the wardens up through the early 1900s. There are pictures of the tower of which I spoke, uh, pictures of the early cell walls, some of the notorious criminals and the like. So I have one for each side. So if you'd like to look at those as I speak of this, you're welcome to do that. Many um, administrative employees also lived in houses that were owned by the Natomas Water and Mining Company, which this was technically their land. And those of you who know much about Folsom, almost all of Folsom was dredged at one time. And if you come to our museum, you will see pictures on the walls that are adjacent to our dredger that shows the patterns of the dredger, and it went all the way on the other side of 50. And uh, if you've ever gone on Folsom Boulevard and you've seen the piles of rocks that are before you get to Lakeside Cemeteries and wonder why they're there, which that's federal property, those are tailings from the dredger that used to go along the river. Uh, so guards and other employees would pitch tents or build their own little shanties, which were cabins on wheels, so that they could move their little house wherever they needed to around prison uh, facility areas. At our Pioneer Village, which is part of the Folsom History Museum, but it's our living history component, I have a little flyer about it for those of you who don't know anything about it. It's at the bottom of Wool and Liedestorf, where we have blacksmiths and panners and the like. We have one of these movable uh, shanties. Uh, it was also used by miners. That's where they got the idea. And of course, it was a mining area, but it was the early mobile home. <laughs> they had it on wheels, and they could move it about to wherever you want. So if you want to see a replica, um, of it, it's at our Pioneer Village. The board of directors assigned Thomas Pockman to be the first superintendent, and you'll see his picture on the handout as it goes around. He did not want the prison to open just yet. He felt it wasn't ready. They needed to build a laundry and bathhouse, but he was overruled, and one week later it was opened anyway. He had a staff of 20. Six of them were officers. So on July 26, 1880, 44 prisoners arrived from San Quentin, and they were supposed to be the roughest, the toughest, and the most mean from San Quentin. And they were transferred by boat and rail. So there was a great debate on who would have the privilege of being prisoner number one entering the gates of Folsom Prison. So they decided the winner was going to be, and this is going to be number five on your quiz, Chong Hing of Canton, China. He was a brutal murderer, and so he was the first to be admitted to the prison. Prisoners worked seven and a half hours per day and without a lunch. Can you imagine that by today's standards? <laughs> Work did end by 2.30. Prisoners wore the traditional black and white striped pants. Now, I brought a costume because we don't have an actual uniform, but they really did wear the old black and white striped outfits. Now, because of the shortage of supply of Folsom being out in the wilderness, they were only issued pants at the beginning. 
and they were allowed to retain their coat, their hat, and shoes that they wore upon arrival. Uh, but later on, when supplies were more plentiful, then they did have the um, shirts and hats that were also striped as well. Uh, let's see. Um, because no bathhouse had been built, as was the concern of the first warden, the men were allowed to bathe along the river's edge in the American River. Well, you all know how cold that water is, so I imagine they were very quick baths. <laughs> and we also had the issues of rattlesnakes being in the area. So for many reasons, the guards were there, yes, to watch over the bathing process and make sure there are no tempted um, escapes, but also they were on guard to protect the prisoners from snakes that were there. 1885, the first female prisoner was received. So that is item number six. Yes, there were females at the prison. However, their crimes were largely related to robbery. They were not the murderous type. Total of six women have been incarcerated at the prison, but none since 1929. The next six years were called the coming of age for the prison because under the, it was the leadership of General John McComb, hillsides were graded, walls were built, farming and vineyards took shape. Those of you who know that um, that land before the dam went in was Mormon Island and it was filled with vineyards. At one time, California had the largest vineyards of, you know, this area had the largest vineyards in all of California. And it was largely in the area that's now under the spillway from the um, Folsom Dam. And so a lot of this goes back to the time of the prison when they started farming and uh, growing the, the vineyards in the area. Construction was begun on a powerhouse and a dam. Not to be confused with the powerhouse that's down off of Liedersdorf in Folsom and not with the current dam. The prison had its own powerhouse and had its own dam. And you can still see bits of it. If you go across Folsom Lake crossing the bridge, don't go the Folsom side, go across and take the Folsom Auburn Road, go across Folsom Lake crossing. If you look very carefully, you can still see remnants of the old powerhouse in that area. It is. Um, and, which is interesting because a couple of my archivists had permission from the warden to go along the bike trail and take pictures of that area, and the guards shoot them away, told them they had to get out of there. Until they built the new trail, I didn't know that was there. Yeah. I read about it, but I thought it was all taken out and uh, destroyed that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but prison laborers began to receive pay, 50 cents a day, which doesn't seem like much, but back in the late 1800s, that was a, that, that was a decent salary uh, for quarrying granite. And you will see pictures up here that I have on the table later of the enormous quarries that were in that area. Again, part of the reason it was selected was the outcroppings of the granite. Um, they also did... Um, have surplus in eggs and butter and other products that they uh, were able to generate at the prison. So they actually sold them to the markets on Sutter Street, the Chan Market and so forth, and surpluses were also taken to San Quentin. So they actually had a very good operation going on. It was very successful. Warden All also began some severe disciplinary measures during 1878 to 1889. He was the one who instituted solitary confinement, bread and water only, and he used something called Susie's Corsets. And I think I have a picture in one of those handouts of Susie's Corsets. But basically, it was a piece of canvas about four feet long and two and a half to three feet wide. They would lay the prisoner face down, and they would stand on the back of the prisoner to make sure all of the air was pushed out of the lungs and the stomach. And they would lace up the eyelets, and therefore have control of the prisoner. They couldn't breathe, so that's how they were able to um, <clears throat> manipulate the prisoner. But that was called <laughs> Susie's Corsets. Um, that warden also used a technique called tricing, and that's where, sorry guys, this is the part that is a little adult. The warden would hang the prisoner by the thumbs, quite literally. 
and if it was a very severe crime, and if it was not something quite as bad, he would hang them by their hands on an area as well as corporal punishment. So he was not known to be the nicest of the wardens. <laughs> By 1891, 700 men were at the prison, and it became crowded. Cells were being wired for electricity, which was considered state-of-the-art technology in prisons at that time, and Folsom was the first prison in all of the United States to have electricity. It was largely due to the canal that was built and the powerhouse um, in 1893. This canal also supplied water to the city of Folsom, for which the powerhouse that's currently there, that's a museum, um, used for its supply for a commercial um, electricity. In 1893, a reservoir was completed and a short line railroad went to the prison, to the village of Folsom for getting supplies. And here, here again, we had the exchange of things that were being grown and raised at the prison being sold in town. Uh, June Chan told me a story, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's the Chan lineage that goes back to the Chan market on Old Sutter Street. Her grandfather ran the market there, and they would frequently get the supplies in from the prison. And she said that the one thing, though, that her grandfather told her stories about um, when she was a very young child is that the prisoners had a sweet tooth, and they never got candy. So it was quite common for prisoners to escape go to their market, buy candy, and go up on what's now East Bidwell Street, where one of the markets where grocery outlets is, where there were just piles of the tailings from the dredge. And they would sit there and eat their candy bars, and they, they didn't really care if they were caught and taken back. They got what they wanted, which was the candy. In June, of, uh, June 27, 1893, the first in the series of many attempted escapes occurred. It's notorious since then with uh, violence. But William Fredericks was discharged and returned to prison to hide some weapons for fellow inmates. He hid two rifles, two revolvers, and some long knives along the rocks and the quarries. And seven convicts attempted to escape and used a guard as a shield. Prisoners opened fire, and a 30-minute battle um, took place. At the end, three convicts died, but no guards, amazingly, were injured. In 1894, another very ingenious thing happened at the prison. An ice house was built at the lower level of the powerhouse, and so ice was sold throughout the entire region. So they started bringing in more money. In 1897, Warden All instituted recreational activities, including baseball and boxing. And when you come up to the tables later, you'll see some pictures of some of the different uh, boxers who were at the prison at one time. Uh, here's a little less known fact because the building doesn't exist anymore. In 1907, the Bug, B-U-G house was constructed, as in what's bugging you. Uh, it was for the criminally insane. It was the early version of the timeout house. <laughs> when criminals couldn't be managed, no matter what was happening in, they get out of control, they were sent the Bug house to cool off, to settle down to yell, to thrash, to do whatever it was that they needed to do until they were in a better state of mind. Uh, it was torn down as part of the construction for the new Folsom Dam. 1903, a chapel was erected and sometimes used for other purposes, a school, a library, a dormitory, but today it's strictly used as a multi-faith chapel. 1909, the first telephone switchboard was installed, so phones were placed then in the guard towers. 1911, ground was broken for the new cell block known as Number One Building, advanced ideas in heating and ventilation and plumbing. It was the eighth largest cell in the U.S. at that time. 1912, corporal punishment ended, including the use of those Susie's corsets, straitjackets, and tying up prisoners by their thumbs and hands. In 1913, striped uniforms were replaced with denim jeans and shirts that are still used today. Have any of you tried to go over to the prison? They won't let you in if you're wearing jeans and blue shirts because you're going to look like one of the inmates. <laughs> so if you even, you know, have permission from the warden, you have to have different clothing than the blue jeans and blue shirts. 
1918, a sewage plant was installed. Prior to that, they were still using the old bucket and build a trench method. In 1923, 460 acres purchased adjoining prison yard expanded from that on, and the prisoners built the walls. And in 1934, work was begun on cell block three. 1960, cell block four was added. In 1986, the final, which is cell block five, was added. Um, I have to tell you one little bit of a story. If you do come to our Folsom History Museum, our restroom for the public is called cell block three. And you literally open a cell block door, which is a photo opportunity. We have people who stand behind it and get pictures of each other because we have the shackles that are there for you to put around your ankle and um, have your picture taken. And then when you open the door to our bathroom, it's the John and June Cash John. Uh, we play the Folsom Prison song, and um, there's entertainment. There's songs on the wall. The most incorrigible prisoners had to wear balls and chains, which was a cannonball weighing between 25 and 30 pounds, uh, attached to a chain, and the prisoners had to sometimes pick it up and run with it. The slang that they used for that was called having to carry the baby. There were about six movies that were filmed at the Folsom Prison, some of which were the Jericho Mile with Peter Strauss. He won an Emmy for that. TV movie, The Outlaws, Reprieve, Cell Block 2, The Riot, which was filmed there in uh, 1953. 1999, Carl Malone of the Jazz had a personal tour by the warden. The famous concert by Johnny Cash was January 13, 1968. He was never a prisoner. He came to do a concert only at the prison. He did wear a bandage for that concert, and afterwards, if you want to come up and take a look at the pictures, he did that for um, effect, tried to make it look like the guards roughed him up, but he was never, ever, ever a prisoner. In fact, the only time he was in a prison was in his own hometown, and that was a county jail and is for reckless driving and such, but he never did really serve time. An inmate made a toaster out of a cardboard box. I guess he had a hankering for toast and they didn't get it, so you know, just got the old hard bread. So he took a, a cardboard box, put striped wire through it, and then um, when he attached it to the electrical outlet, it caused the wires to heat, and he could put a piece of bread on it and toast it on one side. Obviously, it was confiscated because that was a fire hazard. Sammy Davis Jr. performed for the prisoners in November of 1961 because he was there, again, filming a movie. Tennis player Bobby Riggs and Jack Kramer uh, visited the prison on October 3rd of 1940 to demonstrate their tennis skills to the inmates. That would not occur today, obviously. Here's some noteworthy prisoners who have spent time there. Sonny Barger, Hell's Angels leader during the 70s. Eldridge Cleaver, Rick James, the musician. I don't know if you remember his songs. I think he passed away last year. Super Freak, was, I think, was one of his songs. <laughs> Timothy Leary, Charles Manson, Eric Menendez, Bobby Purify. He was the one who sang that old I'm Your Puppet song from way back. The co-ed killer, Edmund Kemper. Jacob Oppenheimer, who was executed July 11, 1913, as California's most brutal convict, also known as the Human Tiger, who was 5'6", 130 pounds. He attacked any and everyone in his sight, the guards and fellow inmates. Even the inmates were afraid of him, and would keep an eye out on him. The only warden to die in the line of duty was Clarence Larkin, who was a giant. He was 6 feet 5 inches tall. He died in September 1937. He was taken hostage during a prison riot. He died from stab wounds and was nearly decapitated by a wire that was around, around his neck. His killers were the first to be executed in San Quentin's gas chamber. Prior to that, it was hanging. Um, Jun Chan also knew um, Larkin. She was a little girl when she she uh, got to meet him. She said he was the nicest man in the world, and this was a real tragedy when this happened to him. Um, 
not a warden, but one of the officers, uh, P.J. Cochran, who was a captain, died while trying to save some prisoners from drowning on the American River, June 23, 1924. Um, executioners were paid an extra $10 to uh, perform the hangings. It was a voluntary job. $10 back in the day was a lot of money, worth several hundred dollars now. Boot Hill is the name of the prison cemetery used until 1959. In the Songs of Johnny Cash songbook that I have up here on the table, there is a song dedicated to Boot Hill. Uh, over, there are over 600 graves that are in Boot Hill. It is no longer used, by the way. Inmate Billy Burke constructed an eight-foot-tall Ferris wheel using over 250,000 toothpicks <laughs> during the 10-month period. It's on display at the prison museum. If you get a chance to go there when it's actually open, they still have it there. It's an amazing feat. And he worked in the carpenter shop, workshop at the prison at the time. September 16th through September 23rd of 1971, over 80 improvised stabbing weapons were confiscated from prisoners during a lockdown. On the table up front, um, when I'm finished, you can come up and take a look. Please don't touch. They are, first of all, they're archival. Second of all, they're the real deal. These are implements that were made by or stolen by prisoners that were confiscated by um, guards, and they have been donated to the museum um, for the purposes of this very thing. Um, this is a gross one. Virgil Flea, F-L-E-A, Teed, transferred to Folsom from San Quentin, was said to have had bad hygiene on purpose, hence fleas. He did this to avoid being physically attacked by fellow inmates. I would use the R word, but there are children present, so <laughs> um, interesting tactic. Charles Manson, who was no longer at Folsom Prison, was sent initially to San Quentin, then Vacaville, then Folsom, then back to San Quentin, and now is in Coraporn because he doesn't get along well with staff and other members. He is in isolation 23 hours of the day and is only out for one hour with several guards for his exercise. A total of 92 executions, which were hangings, were actually done at Folsom Prison over a 42-year period. Granite mined by the prisoners was used to build our state capital foundation. So the next time you go see the state capital, you can imagine it was the prisoners who actually built the foundation, which is kind of interesting. Um, and gravel for the early roads in California. So they ground up the gravel that was later taken out for the roads. Have any of you been to the prison to note their mailing address? Does it say Folsom, California? Impressive. Very good. Why? Because I lived there from 1959 uh, to 58. <laughs> do you know why it's called repressa. That's Spanish meaning to retain or detain. It's the it's Spanish word for dam. And it's right by the Folsom Dam, and so that's why it's called that. Right. Okay. So if you have okay. mail to send to Folsom Prison and you send it, it, it won't go there because it's got to be they repressa. Have their own post office. Correct. They have their very, they have to have their own post office. Who knows what walk the line means? It, it actually relates to walking the straight and narrow, meaning making the right choices. <laughs> Has nothing to do with prison. Um, Johnny Cash just used that line in his song, but it just means making the right choices, doing the right thing, and that's all. It had nothing to do with staying in a line, so that was kind of a trick question. Up on the tables, part of the archives, um, we have a picture uh, looking at uh, part of what remained of the powerhouse. This was taken many years ago, so when you come up later, you can take a good look at that. We have prison staff. This item is really fragile and unique. This was the numerical register in California at the state prison in Folsom that tracked the inmates. You will see all of this was handwritten, and if the prisoner was executed, it's written in pink that they were executed, and it tells the date. Um, so you're welcome to take a good look at this register, and it ended about the 1920s. Um, a calendar was put out in 1990. Uh, that we keep in our archives as well, which some of the pictures that you have, that you've been passing around, have various pictures of inside the prison, and you're welcome to look at that. Some samples, some core samples of granite. 
We have leg irons that were actually from the prison. Again, weapons. This one was kind of interesting because this is wood, this revolver. And you can imagine the amount of time and the secrecy that went involved uh, to the making the revolver. Locks, we have the prison gates, we have the striped uh, uniforms, just about anything that you want to look at that's up here. Um, also, you will notice at the front gate, this is in about the 30s, you'll see FSP, and it has to do with uh, courage, perseverance, and respect, and that's at the front gate. So um, that's pretty much all I had planned for today, and I'm just going to give you time to look through the items that I brought and answer your questions as best as I can. Again, I'm not the expert on the prison, uh, but you're welcome to come and visit and see what we have at our museum anytime as well. So thank you.